Hi, this is Larry Bauer, Chief Executive Officer of the Family Medicine Education Consortium, and I'm communicating this morning with two family physicians uh, about what is the uh, state of uh, the situation that's going on in our country right now with the uh, coronavirus uh, epidemic. With me is uh, Dr. Kenny Lin, a family physician who's deputy editor of the American Family Physician and a family physician who practices and teaches in Washington, D.C. at Georgetown uh, University. Also, I'm with uh, Michael Fine, a family physician, author, um, former director of the Rhode Island Department of Public Health. Uh, Kenny and Michael, thank you very much for uh, joining with me this morning. Thanks for having us. So, Kenny, could you give us kind of a general, start this with a general situational update? I appreciate that things are evolving literally as we speak from day to day, but could you give us the best sense of, of what's the general situation here uh, in the United States as of today, Friday, uh, March the 13th? Uh, so, um, yes, yeah, so I'm getting these the, these statistics fresh from the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Research Center, where they have a global map of, in, <laughs> so, um, both cases and deaths. Um, so they're saying that uh, as of today in the U.S., there are 1,701 confirmed infections, um, and the um, most deaths have occurred in Washington State, where there are 31 deaths, and I believe that many of those were associated with a single nursing home. Um, but this is this is evolving very rapidly, and, and really, actually, three days ago, when I looked at these numbers, they, the U.S. had about a third the number of cases, and I think a large part um, that may be due to just the the uh, shortage of testing materials until very recently, and that as we continue to expand testing, the case numbers are probably going to go up uh, very rapidly. Yeah, I think that I think the observation about testing is very important. Um, until on March 7th, CDC shipped 75,000 test kits around the country. That sounds like a lot, but when you think about the population of the United States, it's a relatively small number. So testing has been uh, hard to get, um, and testing criteria has been variable place by place. Uh, and And it's probably the case that as testing becomes available, more available as it, as it is promised um, over the next two weeks, as we test more people, we will find more cases and also discover or document the presence of community transmission, which we have documented now only in a few places, but may be occurring more commonly. So, could you comment on the confusion, I believe, regarding the, the new testing guidelines? Well, I think you're going to see testing guidelines change as testing becomes more available. Uh, initially, when uh, testing was not much available, CDC focused on people uh, on a very narrow criteria for testing, which were people who had traveled from an endemic area and had symptoms themselves. In that period, CDC was not recommending the testing of contact, um, even at the end of a period of self-isolation. Um, and so it was only those people who were tested. I think what you're going to see is progressive liberalization of that. Uh, right now, I think the general sense is that uh, testing should be reserved for people who uh, present symptomatically and don't have evidence of uh, of influenza or of uh, of of streptococcal disease. Um, but I think we will start to see people with symptoms uh, tested as the testing becomes more available. And then the open question is whether we will be testing people with mild symptoms or people who are contacts at the end of the 14-day isolation period, as there is some evidence, pretty good evidence from Germany, that uh, asymptomatic carriage is possible. Um, and 
uh, asymptomatic transmission also occurs. I think there's um, currently a, a considerable debate about you know, the clinical versus the public health value of testing. Obviously, if you want to identify every case and get a good sense of where the virus is spreading, you'd want to test as many people as possible. But um, from a clinical point of view, if you test someone who's young, healthy, and they have just, you know, kind of a mild fever and cough, there's not a lot that you're going to be able to do for them. Um, my institution currently, in guidelines released just this morning, um, had suggested that we should test people who are at the highest risk of complications. So they suggested people 65 and older, um, people with uh, certain chronic conditions, um, that are, are more likely to need hospitalization, um, so, more, so more of a prognostic um, uh, testing strategy. But I don't know that there's much consistency right now across the country on that. I, I think that's completely correct. Testing has no real value from a clinical perspective, from a treatment perspective, as this is a disease with no treatment and no vaccine, as everyone knows. Um, but it is also very important from a public health and policy perspective uh, to document the presence or absence of community tra transmission. And that's why there will be places and situations where more widespread testing uh, is going to be useful. So could you could I ask the two of you to comment on the immediate challenges faced by family physicians and residency programs in particular? And why don't you take that as that's your more more your world than mine? Well, so I I think you know one, honestly one of the challenges is that many of the public health measures that we're taking that I think are appropriate in in um, you know banning or postponing mass gatherings, uh, closing schools, uh, closing colleges, um, put put some stress on uh, you know family physicians because we're you know we're parents too we uh, uh, you know we're we're used to our kids being in school during the week and so we can see patients and teach and and I think that 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 kind of the initial challenge, like who's going to be taking care of our kids, and uh, when we're um, you know trying to see patients who may have coronavirus or or uh, you know teach at programs that uh, where we're you know we're trying to disperse everybody, so we're doing a lot of online learning um, and trying to transition to that as well. So I, you know I think those are those are kind of the immediate things I can think about. You know the other kind of issue is you know there's always this tension between um, you know, how much of residency is service versus how much is, is, is learning. And, when, you know, when you have a, a, an epidemic going on, like it, you, you may be forced to cancel things that, that uh, now look like luxuries, like, uh, you know, lectures and other topics, um, you know, certain learning experiences. You may want to just get as many of your residents in the clinic and seeing patients uh, or in the, you know, in the emergency room or um, to, to kind of handle the demand. But obviously the learning um, uh, mission may have to take uh, kind of a second second place for a while. And I think oh, from the practice perspective, I think from the practice perspective, there are a number of challenges. Um, the first is triage, trying to figure out who you need to see in the office um, and who you can take care of over the phone, understanding that uh, having people clustered in a waiting room and not knowing what they're sick with or how infectious they are is a real infection control problem uh, in of itself. Uh, staffing is going to be a problem, I suspect, um, as uh, the support staff and clinical staff uh, will become ill and may need uh, isolation themselves. Uh, the presence and absence of personal protective equipment, um, how and when to use it, uh, particularly in a resource-constrained environment, I expect to be a real challenge. And then, and then I think there are fairly substantial business model challenges. That is to say, we still exist in this legacy dinosaur world of fee-for-service. So practices support themselves on seeing patients, and yet at this point, 
it is probably unnecessary and maybe inappropriate to see people with coronavirus uh, who have mild symptoms because that's the way we'll spread disease. And when we stop seeing them, as many of us have tried to do, that impacts our bottom line. And so this is a time for us, for our organizations, um, and for government itself to advocate to switch us at least temporarily uh, to some kind of advanced capitation so we can support the business side of uh, being available by telephone, doing telephone triage, um, and being effective as, as, public, as part of the public health infrastructure um, without trying to, to generate income by seeing more patients each day. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I, I think this uh, epidemic has exposed a lot of deficiencies in our uh, in business model for medicine. Um, you know, as an example, I, I was reviewing just this morning the, the CDC guidance not on not on uh, uh, patient management or assessment or testing, but on coding, because the, there was a question from you know many health organizations. Well, how do we get paid for this? And what you know what specific ICD-10 codes do you use? And it depends on if they have pneumonia. It depends if infections confirmed. And there's all these different variants. And you know, I felt kind of a deep frustration in that I'm I'm sort of wasting time. It's not wasted time because it's necessary to keep um, to keep our program going to make sure that we get paid for the work we do. But uh, that it's almost a distraction when you're um, confronting something like this. Um, we're also looking into doing televisits, but yes, it's the same. It's a question of are, are, are these going to be paid? You know, uh, uh, even though the 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 from a clinical perspective, the most appropriate thing is to to not bring people to the office if they have mild illness um, to just um, just evaluate them and take care of them at home. Um, the the business model doesn't really support that. The business model says everybody needs to come in, or um, you know, or or this never happened, and you don't get paid for it. So it's yeah, I I hope that that you know things that we may throw together uh, in the pressure of the moment, uh, eventually we we look at and say yes, like the better way to, is to you know have prospective primary care payment based on you know the, the number of people you're seeing and maybe the complexity of their underlying medical illness. Um, you know, certainly uh, uh, practices like direct primary cares are very well suited for um, this uh, kind of management because they already have prospective payment. They already do telehealth, and you know it's not necessary for them to physically see uh, many patients. Uh, but those of us in the fee for service world are finding it much more difficult. One so, if I can offer me. an observation uh, for a moment, I was at a meeting down in Dallas last Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and when people, and just a week ago, when people, the the participants were coming together to this meeting, they were all shaking hands and in some cases hugging one another because they're friends and colleagues for many years. And, and what really struck me is that there was almost a, um, not a denial, but a, a lack of mindfulness uh, about being in the middle of an, or start of an epidemic, and that if the, the physicians and their staff get sick, then capacity uh, dwindles very, very quickly. Um, so I, I think that the, the docs and the staff, um, seeing how at risk they are and how important they are to being able to uh, care for the population, I think that uh, awareness is something that also needs to be really uh, brought home to people. You know, one of the capacity issue is real. One of the pieces that nobody has seen is that in China, about 60% of the population has and uses a primary care clinician. In the United States, the evidence suggests that it's closer to 43% or less. So if we get a surge of lots of people who are ill, um, it is going to be really difficult for practices uh, to take care of that surge because we haven't built out the primary care delivery system in such a way as to have make sure that every American has primary care doctor. Um, and that's the challenge and that's the opportunity as we see this, really getting our policy focused on providing primary care to all Americans 
Do we have the surge capacity we need, as well as uh, have the ability to uh, leverage primary care to reduce cost and improve, improve public health outcomes, uh, which is how other advanced nations uh, provide health care to all their population in a way that is affordable um, and effective. Dr. Fine, the other day that when we were talking, you mentioned a statistic that caught me by surprise and got me thinking that uh, we we need to get this information out. You talked about the percentage of the population that is very likely to test, if tested, but very likely to um, develop uh, the virus. Could you comment on that for the audience? Sure. Well, I don't I don't think we know the answer. Uh, Angela Merkel in Germany thinks it's 60 to 70 percent. You know, this is a virus to which we have no known immunity, um, which has respiratory transmission. So I think somewhere between 60 and 90 or 100 percent. I think those of us who don't get it will be the exception. And the challenge from a public health perspective is to flatten the curve, that is, try to, to use social distancing, make sure that not everybody gets sick all at once. Because if that happens, we will overload the capacity of hospitals and intensive care units uh, to care for those people. Remembering about 6% of people who get this disease will get very severe disease and require supportive care. Um, if all that happens at once, that's where, where our, our, our real uh, resource challenge is going to be. But I think everybody needs to start understanding that we're not going to really prevent its spread. Pretty much everybody is going to get it. We have to be prepared for everybody to get it um, and have to have the resources we need to continue our operations, to continue taking care of patients, um, and to be as helpful and supportive as we can during what looks like it's going to be a somewhat protracted um, and difficult time. I'm thinking that this is going to range, is going to run somewhere between two and four months um, at the least. There are, there are a couple of um, you know, tweets that I saw uh, in the last day or so that were that I think encompass um, you know, much of what uh, Dr. Fine just said. You know, one, one was that. You know, someone said, well, you know, all, all these, um, you know, these cancellations of sporting events and closing the schools and, and uh, dispersing of mass gatherings, it's, it's a sacrifice that, that, that the population is making, um, but we're, you know, it's a sacrifice that we're making in order to give our healthcare professionals a fighting chance um, of uh, being able to, to uh, manage the epidemic, to keep, to keep it under the capacity of the health system so we will have enough hospital beds, enough intensive care unit beds, uh, enough, health, enough uh, bodies just to, just to uh, care for all these people who will get sticker. Um, and, uh, the, the, and the other one was um, uh, that um, uh, looking at you know, also taking kind of a, a long-term perspective was that um, if if the virus is still circulating and, and and some people haven't been infected, you know, several months from now, that would be a victory because it does mean we flatten the curve. Um, we don't want everyone to get sick at the same time. So if, if people are are getting this later, um, that you know that means public health succeeded. It doesn't mean that we failed because you know as you said, most people uh, are likely to get this at some point. But if we can uh, delay that the onset of that, then that that would be uh, a big win. Uh, and you can see that in some of the countries. When you look at the trajectory of, of uh, you know, as compared to China and Italy, um, which have, you know, really ha struggled uh, to to uh, keep ahead and to have enough healthcare resources to deal with the uh, the illness, um, South Korea um, uh, has has a has had a different trajectory. They still have a lot of cases, almost 8,000 as of now. But um, if they had if they had had the trajectory that Italy was had, they'd have a lot more, uh, and they. Uh, implemented many of these social distancing th um, interventions very early on, and a lot of testing, um, so they could. Uh, so their officials were, were very much on top of it. So even though I think there will still be a lot of uh, cases and deaths there, it, 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 they, they averted you know quite you know, thousands more. And actually, if you look at what happened in China itself, 
um, in Wunan, um, there was serious disease. But there's actually almost no uh, current transmission outside of that one city. Uh, and that's what China was able to do um, by really locking things down. It's a very impressive story. And actually, in that one city, the number of new cases has now dropped single digits a day. So they've been very effective. Um, and they're a model that we ought to be looking at closely, as well as what's been done in South Korea, where I should mention testing has been widespread for at least a couple of weeks. So I'm going to ask the two of you to put on your uh, prognostication hat. And given what is happening in this country in terms of creating uh, social distancing or implementing social distancing, distancing strategies, what do you think is, is likely for us over the next, say, three to six months? And I, I realize there's no data for this, but I'll, I'll put you on the spot I think anyway. we'll keep things, I think we'll be pretty quiet for the next three or four months. Um, I think we will be very effective in reducing the height of the curve, in stretching, you know, in reducing the number of people who are sick at once. I'm very impressed. Uh, with how people have really risen to the challenge around the country and changing their behavior, left, right, up, and down. Um, I think there will be some challenges from a continuity of operations perspective for practices, um, which will, unless government steps to the table and starts really providing economic support for those practices in a different way, I think it's going to be hard for us to the function as practices uh, because of the billing problem and the, you know our traditional re reliance on fee for service. But I suspect government will get the message. Um, and if we work together and our organizations work together with government, I think this may be a moment when we get government to recognize that primary care has a public purpose and starts paying us for that public purpose uh, so we can deliver what we need to in support of the public's health. I think it's really important that there is outreach to the most vulnerable populations, uh, particularly people who don't routinely access the healthcare system to, to make testing uh, widely available and free at the point of service. Um, you know, there's no treatment at this point. I think different investigational agents are being tested um, but if some if, if some sort of treatment does become available again that 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 needs to be widely available and and you know and, and issues with copayments and deductibles you know we don't want those to be obstacles to uh, people uh, getting um, you know whatever we can provide uh, for them um, and similarly although a vaccine I think is you know maybe more than a year off that um, you know historically you know vaccines have had spotty coverage and you know only maybe uh, Ten years ago, with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, did, it, uh, did certain vaccines become guaranteed to people who had insurance? Uh, but even then, there's uh, there's there's often obstacles to getting those to people um, because our, our our distribution system is can be creaky through primary care practices or through health departments, and we can often miss um, uh, many people. And in this case, with this kind of transmissible disease, we we want to get as wide coverage as possible. Um, I think the public health aspect is also important just because the messaging, uh, you know, I've seen some sort of sarcastic uh, posts on social media that, oh, if we had a vaccine for this disease, you know, half of you wouldn't get it anyway, which which is, well, you know, sarcastic, but to some extent true because of the, um, the much of the misinformation that, that circulates about uh, the harms of uh, vaccines, which we know are absolutely safe. Um, with this being a new vaccine, uh, that that we'd be developed, we wouldn't be able to even assure that. But just kind of impressing upon people the importance and um, and that it, that it, if the assessment was made that it was a uh, uh, safe and recommended that that we could reach um, people who normally would not um, you know wouldn't get you know the regular flu vaccine or any or, or uh, other vaccines that we might recommend. A really good point, and this is also an opportunity for family physicians in particular to speak up for their patients. Uh, people who are lower income, 
are going to struggle with this situation, I think, more than anyone else. They will, they will be differentially affected. And that's because when you're living paycheck to paycheck, uh, to lose your child care when your school goes on vacation, or uh, to have your hours reduced, or not to be able to work at all for a couple of weeks, uh, puts an unusual and exceptional burden on your ability to function. This is a time for us to speak up for universal sick time uh, and to speak up for other kinds of unemployment benefits that may be needed carry the people we take care of through this process. I think our friends in industry are talking about bailouts for uh, airlines and other businesses. I mean, I'm sure that has value, but I think the people who speak for our patients um, are their family physicians. Yeah, I agree. I um, one of the uh, you know, our, our uh, the local schools here really struggle with the decision to close because um, they were concerned about all the kids who get free or reduced cost meals in school, and, and it, it actually makes up, uh, I think, a majority of the kids who go to school in the District of Columbia. So they, um, they, you know, they were sort of trying to figure out how do we distribute food to these kids who are, you know, who usually this is not a part of their their parents or guardians' budget. Um, because they're kind of living paycheck to paycheck, and um, and they've arranged some distribution, but it's those are the kinds of things that you really have to think through in uh, in, in you know, a country where we don't have the, the 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 social safety net that you know some of these other countries do have. So I want to thank both of you for uh, spending time with us today and sharing this. We're going to be sending this message out later this afternoon once it's been uh, rendered trying to get it out to all of the uh, family medicine community that the FMEC is connected with. Um, any final comments before we sign off? I guess my only, my only final comment is to remind everyone that family medicine has a public purpose. We need to remember that. Uh, we need to talk about it. And we need to make sure that it gets recognized by government uh, and by the population as a whole. Uh, that is a I great. Think, Go ahead. I, I think this is a time that uh, family physicians can really shine. Uh, we, you know, we have extensive training in prevention, um, and we have you know the the, the relation the trusting relationships with uh, patients that uh, will allow us to to maybe communicate messages more effectively than you know distant public health uh, uh, or, or federal officials. So it's it's really up to us to. Um, to pitch in right now. Well, I want to thank you both very much, and um, we're going to bring things to closure here. Thanks, Larry, for putting this together. Yeah, thank you, Larry. My pleasure. Thank you.